Juan, just a quick uh, just a quick sound check from you. If you could just quickly indicate in the chat box if the audio is fine. Thank you very much. I see replies. Um, also, just to for quality of audio, some people sometimes do have difficulties with the audio, especially if they are on the um, mobile uh, cell phones or even on their desktop PCs. It is very useful to use an earpiece um, and therefore the quality of audio is way better. So um, just um, a little tip for the morning. So welcome again, everybody, to uh, another COVID-19 webinar brought to you by the National Institute for Occupational Health, the NIOH. The NIOH is a specialized division of the National Health Laboratory Services um, and, <clears throat> pardon, and a sister institute of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Um, and as you've noticed, we have now reached way over our um, twin, uh, pardon, um, one moment, I just want to start that again. Um, we've reached our 77th webinar uh, in the COVID-19 webinar series brought for you uh, to promote and strengthen the workplace prevention and um, uh, uh, compli sorry, compliance, prevention, as well as workplace um, adherence to COVID-19 requirements in order to ensure that ourselves and our fellow employees, our fellow workers are kept safe within the workplace and as the workplace contribute to the national efforts of dealing with the ongoing COVID-19 challenges. And quite clearly, given the uh, third wave and certain provinces having greater difficulties than others, however, the concern that um, the more populous and uh, highly populated provinces being um, all under potential threat of increasing cases of COVID positive diagnosed people. The workplace where we play an important role um, as a occupational health and safety community is critical in supporting the overall efforts towards addressing this challenge. Clearly, we've been in the challenge now for more than a year. Um, we are still in our lockdown now at level four, um, and our efforts are going to be very important to deal with any new variants that may come our way as we are now facing uh, the, new, the Delta variant uh, being dominant in our uh, space. So again, for, uh, from an occupational health, occupational health and safety point of view, um, we bring you this particular webinar on dealing with working from home, um, the occupational health and safety policy and reasonable accommodation during COVID-19. And again, we are pleased to bring to you a number of um, uh, very excellent uh, presenters and speakers who will bring to us their knowledge, experience, expertise, recommendations and advice in how to deal with the question of working from home. Level four and particularly here in Gauteng, where our numbers are um, uh, of worrying levels, um, the question of working from home has been uh, strongly reintroduced and we want to deal with this a particular topic today as an important aspect. Um, I uh, need to uh, just put an apology in for Dr. Tanusha Singh, our head of the COVID-19 Occupation of Outbreak Response Team, the COVID-19 OHO team. She unfortunately has other very critical uh, work obligations and could not join us this morning. So on behalf of the NIH, welcome again to this Working From Home webinar. Um, I'm going to now ask um, uh, just to confirm the um, audio link and if necessary video link to our colleagues who have um, kindly um, agreed to assist us from the Richard Spoor Incorporated Attorneys and to Yev, Dr. Mudimu and um, uh, Mr. George Khan is online with us. And without much further ado, I wish to quickly move over to them once we can just settle some of the technical issues and some virtual housekeeping. So um, just a quick check in with our colleagues from RSI attorneys, uh, Richard Spoor Incorporated attorneys. Um, George, just to check, um, is your um, audio okay? Yes, I think you can hear me. Yes, perfectly. Um, you do sound a little bit distant from the microphone. Can I just also check if uh, Dr. Midumu is with you? 
the doctor is a candidate attorney of ours, so he's got a PhD in this aspect of law. He's going to be assisting with acute questions and answers, and he assisted me with the slide. So I'm going to be doing the presentation, if you don't mind, and he's going to be assisting with the Q&A. Um, and we're quite lucky to have a PhD in the firm with this type of law. I'm sure yes. we're going to get quite far. And we are also quite uh, fortunate to have both of you available for the session. It's just that I couldn't find him on the attendee list to promote as a speaker panelist. So thanks for confirming that, George. A quick um, housekeeping issues. You have seen the slide going past um, before we started. Um, for all attendees, please, the hand raising function is not operational for this particular session. And the main reason for that, I see there's eight of you already that have raised your hands. Um, for a large number of people, and we're slowly edging towards um, 600 people already for this webinar, we can take a maximum of um, 1,000. Um, the hand raising function is completely impracticable. So um, impractical, and we would ask you to please type any questions you have for the content of the presentations of our presenters in the question and answer box. You'll see the two um, speech bubbles at the bottom. There are already three, I think, comments there. I'll check if there are general comments. Four general comments, don't type them in the question and answer box. Please type them in the chat box. We will reply to you in the chat box. So a quick refresher. Question and answers for our presenters in the Q&A box with the two dot bubbles. The single bubble at the bottom of your Zoom screen is for your general admin and other issues you want to raise in the chat box. We will greatly appreciate that. So I'm going to ask uh, Mandy Beckley, Franz Wimbrink, uh, S. van Roy, Sidi uh, Ntsoe, Dion van Vieren, Sonite Msomi, Joyce Kaud, Karen Holman, and Mandy, or oh, well, Mandy I've mentioned already, please just um, uh, deactivate your hand raised functions. We won't be able to assist you through that mechanism. And I've already mentioned the importance of your questions in the question answer box and general comments and other matters in the chat box. So uh, without further, oh, just also to add, our session has been accredited for CPD points with those uh, uh, um, uh, professional bodies that have provided such accreditation um, and a test uh, as well as the link for that test will be circulated after the webinar. Another uh, link you will receive after the webinar is an opportunity for you to provide us with feedback on the webinar. Comments you may have would include any new topics you want to suggest to us, and that's through the REDCAP platform we will be doing that. Um, and then also, obviously, we'll send everybody a general certificate of attendance uh, without much further ado. Um, I'm going to um, hand over to George. I'm going to ask George also just to do me a favor and introduce his team himself and uh, Dr. Mudimo, a doctor in law. I hand over to you, George, immediately. Please share your slides. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just trying to, where do I share my slides? Oh, there's a button. Uh, Sorry, I'm more yeah. familiar with this. Uh, no problem. The little green function at the bottom of the screen. There you go. Sure. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Let me just Perfectly. My yes. Part. It is maximized. That's great. Um, your audio sounds uh, a little bit soft. If you could move closer to your microphone, that'll be great. Um, if you have a headset or um, an earpiece uh, with a microphone. I have that a really microphone good. that sits on my desk. Can you hear me a bit better now? I don't want to that sounds a little bit better. Maybe you could just raise the sound a bit, but we'll monitor it as we go along. I hand over to you. Um, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, George Kahn, um, a senior associate at the Richard Spoor Incorporated Associates, RSI Associates. Um, and we are happy to have them on our, our webinar again. I'll hand over to you immediately. Thank you, George. Thank you. And thank you to your listeners and the NIH for providing this opportunity and this platform to us. Uh, we understand that we are required and requested to try and assist with some sort of introductory in terms of the question of work from home or WFH, if you will, and dealing with the legalities and the law and that's relating to these issues. Um, if we can just proceed in terms of the agenda, what we're going to be talking about essentially is um, who we are. So I'm going to do a very short uh, explanation of who it is that we are. And the reason why that is very important, as I always allude to, is it's very important that you understand where the content of your information comes from. 
We live in an age of Facebook and YouTube, and it's very important that you get the right information from the right people. The NIOH is probably the best experts in the field in relation to these, es these aspects. So you are obviously um, at the right place, and I'm preaching to the choir. We will then also be dealing with the sources of law. This is going to be basically about where it is that you would need to look as an employer or employee or a union um, in terms of trying to understand the aspects that relate to this question and the subject. We're gonna have a little bit of a discussion about the, the context of what we're talking about. And then we're gonna go into the content itself. And uh, as you can see there, we're going to try and touch on very briefly certain aspects, um, the right to be kept safe at home, uh, a home risk assessment, the concept of uh, work home-based workplace hazards, uh, we're also going to touch on very briefly mental wellness, which is an important aspect about working from home as well, which is frequently overlooked. And then I understand there will be a speaker at the end of this, but we will also briefly touch on what COIDA implications for COIDA is at home. And there will be a brief uh, conclusion. And I understand that there will be questions and answers in terms of the process that's been outlined to you, and we'll deal with those in due course. Just in terms of an introduction of the firm that I work for, uh, Richard Square Attorneys is a human rights law firm that has a special interest in occupational health and safety. We are probably best well known for our work in class action litigation, where we have previously sued the gold mining companies, uh, which resulted in a partial settlement. Uh, for those mine workers living with silicosis and tuberculosis. We also presently in the process of litigation with Tiger Brands for the listeriosis outbreak, and there are a couple of other uh, aspects which are in the pipeline. Uh, what we do is we're specifically interested in these kinds of questions. Uh, in terms of the COVID last year, we assisted AMCU in bringing an application to compel the Minister of Minerals and particularly the Chief Inspector of Mines to introduce uh, necessary and required guidelines in order to assist the mines in adopting a universal and standardized approach to dealing with this pandemic. In order just to explain who I am a little bit about myself, I've been practicing law for a little bit over a decade now. Uh, what is interesting about me, which makes me a little bit different from other lawyers, is that I also studied science and medicine prior to going into law. Um, I come from a medical family, coincidentally, my father's an occupational medical practitioner in the Free State. Um, I was also taught molecular biology, which was one of my majors, so the virus is something that I'm actually quite interested in. Um, I grew up in the gold fields, as I said, and I worked very frequently and quite, uh, quite often with gold mining communities. Um, I'm also presently being requested by Professor Paul Benjamin and due to, to help them in order to assist in updating the commentary of the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, um, and the COIDA commentary. That's a little bit about me. Uh, I don't have a slide, unfortunately. We seem to have met my colleague, but just to explain to my colleague is God knows, is a candidate attorney who's joined our firm this year. We are very fortunate to have him on. He has actually got a PhD in occupational health and safety law, which we're very lucky. Um, candidate attorneys seem to become more and more qualified every day. Um, and I'm sure that he's going to go a very long way um, in his career once he's admitted as an attorney. In terms of the law that we have to deal with and consider, obviously we always start with the constitution. The constitution is the be all and end all of all aspects of law. So we always start and end in the consideration of the constitution. And that is going to be quite important in one specific right as well, which is frequently overlooked in health and safety issues and in terms of the context of work from home. And that is the right to privacy, which is going to, we're going to come and touch on a little bit later. In terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, we obviously have a number of regulations that are directly applicable to these issues. I've listed some there as well. I understand that we have previously provided a bundle of documents to the NIH, which I understand that they will make available. The bundle is essentially all the regulations that I would consider to be somewhat important that you should try and just be mindful of and be considerate of when looking at these kinds of issues, but they're not necessarily restricted to work from home. There's a whole lot of issues here that you'll actually see are quite um, 
uh, flexible in the sense that they can relate to normal non-work from home scenarios and work from home scenarios. Uh, what is important to understand, and this is where I think everyone got a bit of a fright, is that the Occupational Health and Safety Act does not define a workplace which it has jurisdiction over as what you conventionally understand as a formal workplace. It's not restricted to factory floor places or office blocks, that sort of thing. A workplace is essentially any place where work is done for the employer. That means that your workplace may in fact be your car. It may in fact be your study at home. It might even be your kitchen where you are baking things for your local home industry. And that is why it is important to always look at the legalities here and all of these regulations. And whatever you find in terms of regulations, you will find all to the work from home scenario, obviously with obviously taken in the context into account and there are some slight difficulties and issues there that will go into that. One of the things that then uh, we have to also consider, and this is a question that was raised with me, is in our country, we have a dual system of occupational health. Now, what I mean by that is we have two separate uh, acts, one which deals with non-mine workers and one that deals with everybody else. So the previous legislation we referred to, the OSHA, deals with basically everybody else that falls outside of the mining and works industry, the extractive industries, if you will. Um, the work, the miners, however, have their own dedicated legislation, Mine Health and Safety Act. And the question then came, to what extent is that legislation applicable to a work from home scenario? I mean, obviously the difficulty is you can't imagine to yourself a gold miner who normally mines underground working from home. That certainly can't be the case. However, what we are now encountering and realizing is that you do have a situation where some mining aspects may actually be able to be done remotely. Here you can see a web, a web page where they are explaining how, uh, in this case, it's actually Anglo-American, is trying to actually install Wi-Fi underground in their coal mines in Oklahoma. Um, and the reasons for that are obviously relating to safety, but also in order to ensure that the production is all streamlined and made more effective. Um, and obviously this is something that may become more and more predominant as we go along. Um, I understand from chief inspectors that we are probably a long way off from this becoming mainstream in South Africa, um, but it may become a part and parcel of the mainstream mining sector in the future, we can only hope. In terms of the Mine Health and Safety Act, what is important to understand is whether or not a home could be considered part of it and fall under it. Now, the way it works is I've indicated on this slide what the definitions are for uh, uh, an employee, including what a mine and works is. Now, an employee is simply defined as a person who works at a mine. A mine is de uh, defined as anyone who's working with a mineral deposit or in any mining area or mining building and structures and whatnot. And the works obviously includes any person who might also be dealing with um, repairing or training or um, electrical issues or IT and that sort of thing. So the definition is actually, although it's quite narrow and restricted in some ways, in many other ways it is quite broad. In fact, if you go through the legislation, you'll see that one of the few places that a mine inspector does not have the authority to come in and investigate is actually a person's home. In terms of section 50, which sets out the powers of a mine inspector to come in and inspect the premises on the mining area, the one area, one of the few areas that is restricted from then power to come in is actually a person's home. That clearly indicates a parliament intended that a person's home does in fact fall under the Mine Health and Safety Act when applicable. Now, when it's applicable is going to be a question of fact. It's going to depend on whether the person is living on the mining area or whether the person is residing in a hostel or those types of scenarios. Okay, and as you can also see, the Mine Health and Safety Act also has, in terms of its definitions, details that deal specifically with biological entities, which would obviously include um, COVID. And as I've indicated earlier, we assisted AMCU last year in you know, getting the guidelines gazetted for the mandatory code of practice for COVID outbreak aspects. 
What is also important to understand in terms of the law with uh, work from home is that COEDA is implicated. Um, simply because you might be injured at home, you might, uh, for example, drown in the pool while doing your work. That does not mean simply because it's at home and it falls outside of the scope of COEDA. The Compensation of Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act also defines any occupational disease and injury as something that happened and arose within the scope and course of a person's employment. That in itself is a very difficult concept and we'll come to that in a bit. Obviously, then we also have all the other legislation that is relating to this, which is going to be applicable, including the UIF benefits, the maternity benefits and whatnot. And obviously, despite the fact that you are working from home, the basic conditions of the Employment Act still are applicable. You are still entitled to your lunch break and you are still entitled to sick leave. Okay. What I just point out, though, for everyone is the fact that sick leave uh, when it is relating to an occupational disease, and that in itself has got a big question mark, but when we are accepting that it is an occupational disease or an injury, um, that does not take away from a person's sick leave benefit. So you can't remove a sick leave from a person who's been diagnosed with an occupational injury or disease. Obviously, we then also have all the disaster, disaster management act um, regulations, and at this point in time, they are probably longer than the length of my arm. And it is very important to make sure that you keep up to date with the latest versions. Um, so it's no good looking at what was previously stated because you may in find, in fact, find that those have been amended and are no longer applicable, and things have been changed. It is, of course, helpful, in my opinion, to still have some sort of consideration of the old stuff because it would give you sort of a sense of what is trying to be achieved and the purpose of trying to interpret what we have at the moment. What is also important to understand when considering sources of law is that the common law is still present and powerful in this regard and must be considered. You can't simply say that because it's not recorded in the Occupational Health and Safety Act or it's not recorded in the Mine Health and Safety Act, it doesn't, it's, it's not the law. That is not in fact the case. The common law in many regards is far broader than legislation. The legislation in many regards actually augments the legislation. Um, well, the legislation, beg your pardon, augments the common law, should I rather say. For example, the Mine Health and Safety Act has this statutory right to right to refuse dangerous work. You will not find a corresponding right under the OSHA. That does not mean that a factory worker does not have the same right. Their right is derived from the common law. Um, and in fact, the common law right to refuse dangerous work in some regards is actually broader than the statutory right that can be found in the Mine Health and Safety Act. And what I mean by that is the Mine Health and Safety Act requires the person to first witness the danger um, themselves directly and then exercise the right. Whereas in the common law, you may have a situation where it's not necessary for you to act person witness the danger if it is clearly present and is well known. So for example, an invisible virus. Obviously, the way in which that is exercised, I'll come to it in a moment, but it, it must be objectively exercised. I also do want to point out that despite everyone thinking that COIDA prevents an employee from suing their employer, which is correct in vast majority of cases, there are loopholes to that, meaning that if an employer uses her employees through a labour broker, the law is going to regard the labour broker as the employer of that person, and in the event that that person becomes sick or injured or dies, the principal, the company, would be liable and be able to be sued under the common law. So the common law there again is applicable. And there are actually instances where our courts have said that those individuals or those companies and entities can be held strictly liable um, by the employee or their dependents. It's not always a case of fault. We obviously live in a world that's quite strange with the pandemic and the COVID. And technology itself is changing the world that we live in. Here we have a newspaper headline indicating that medical surgeons are able to perform surgery using a cell phone technology. Um, we've already previously in the past had similar types of things in South Africa and Africa where surgery has been done remotely. 
this is one of the instances where we now we're using a simple cell phone in order to do that. And we might eventually arrive upon a world where work from home is going to become far more commonplace. In actual fact, the International Labour Organization, and I've provided their documents to the NIH, which I understand they'll make available, has uh, prepared a document on this issue and this question. And what they do is they also do is uh, differentiate between the different types of work from home that you may find. So there are examples of telework, telecommuting, or remote working. And I understand that there are differences in terms of each of those. For our purposes, though, the differences aren't really important, and we're just going to put them all into one big category. What we need to understand, as I've, as I've indicated, is that this is what we are talking about. We're talking about a situation where we are now going to be moving more and more towards a remote working scenario. We're using technology. However, what is very important to understand is that this is not something which is new. The law has always been the case that you can work from home and the law has always been applicable in these regards. And it's not something that is now suddenly arisen for the first time because we have Zoom or Teams. Um, these types of scenarios have arisen quite frequently. In this regard, what most of us think of when we think of work from home, I would imagine, is uh, what sometimes would refer to as professionals working from home. Um, there's a thing called the Patterson job grading. I'm sure the HR people are quite familiar with it. What it does is it differentiates all employees into different bands and different categories based on their level of qualification, the complexity of what they do. Um, this is typically used in order to ensure that people are paid correctly, but it is also a helpful way of trying to understand what, how different types of jobs work compared to one another. So, for example, professional staff would typically be regarded in what would be called a D band or an E band or an F band, whereas you might in fact find some workers that are in the C or Bs, um, for example, uh, secretaries or data captures. Now, what is important to understand is that we, although you at may at first glance think to yourself that we're talking about work from home is relating to uh, managers and lawyers and those types of people that can, and architects that can clearly work from home. It's not a difficulty. They have a laptop, a computer, and they can do so. This is not necessarily the case. There is no restriction in this regard. In actual fact, you may find that a variety of different positions can work from home. In fact, some positions are required to work from home inherently. For example, a babysitter or a care worker or even a domestic worker. Their jobs would be somewhat strange if it weren't, wasn't based on a home basis. Of course, you do find that there are other individuals, and I think we've all encountered people who are within these categories that are working from home. So for example, artisans and bakers are doing more and more what they do at home now than what they were doing previously in their sort of workplace that they previously had. And it is important to understand that each one of these categories is going to have their own unique uh, difficulties and challenges. For those of you who see this picture, I mean, what we all imagine to ourselves as a person working from home and looking all discovered and traveled, the person in this photograph is actually Daisy DeMarco. For those of you that may remember, she was one of the first women in South Africa to be executed. She was known as the Black Widow. The reason why I put her on this is essentially she also was very famous because she was kept in the Constitutional Hill Prison. Uh, which is presently next to the Constitutional Court. That prison was designed around a concept of um, an all-looking eye, which was pioneered by Jeremy Bentham, the con famous consequentialist philosopher, the end justifies the means. And that concept was also incorporated during Victoria and England into what was previously known as workhouses where an employees that would have to live in these workhouses and work from home um, essentially had to always be watched at all times. The reason why I raise this in a very admit, tangent manner is because one of the things that is very important to understand is that privacy is an important consideration that must be taken into account when working from home. Um, in this regard, you may be interested to know that teams, for example, will allow an employee to track an employee. And these types of things need to be taken into consideration when working from home. Health and safety does not 
negate these issues. And that becomes important when we go to the concept of risk assessments. Now, in terms of an employer's duties to the employee, we all know that an employer must do risk assessments. There is nothing that restricts that to a home situation, meaning that an employer must make sure that they are also making sure that their home situation is safe for an employee to continue and practice their work and conduct their employment. In a situation where they can't do so, and there might be a variety of reasons, the employer may need to intervene and try and rectify the situation within reason, or alternatively indicate that the employee may not continue with the work because they cannot assure that it is safe. Um, and it is very important to understand what we need to try and do is balance here as well the, con the, 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 the counteracting interests of health and safety, which would require an employee and a boss HR manager to come and witness the home site and conserve themselves and the privacy of the employee that may be deeply uncomfortable with the type of situation. I've heard uh, recommendations from colleagues of mine, and I don't think they're wrong, that it is permissible in a situation where you don't necessarily have to physically go home to the home of the employee, but you can do a, a questionnaire sort of thing, an investigation with the employee, with the employee must cooperate in trying to answer the employer's questions in this regard, so that we try and preserve some level of privacy of the employee. What is important though, is to try and ensure that those questions are answered correctly and fully. When conducting a risk assessment, obviously the, the core aspect is to try and identify when there is an objective risk that may result in the physical harm or uh, medical harm to an employee. Of course, the issue then becomes that in the event that there is an objective of danger, the employee also has a right to refuse dangerous work. So in a situation where an employer has failed to identify a risk and the employee has in fact identified that and is concerned that that is going to result in a manifestation of a hazard, um, the employee is entitled to refuse that dangerous work under the common law and under the Mine Health and Safety Act. However, it is important to understand that that must be exercised in an objective manner. It's not based upon what the employee's subjective feeling is. An employee may feel that they are quite terrified of spiders. That does not necessarily mean that they will constitute an objective danger. An objective danger would be something that a reasonable person, hypothetically reasonable person, would accept and turn around and say to everyone, yes, that is actually dangerous. Um, so it's not within a particular person's mind frame. It has to be on an objective level. And what is important to understand is the onus for this is on the employee in order to exercise that right to refuse dangerous work. We've already pointed out that an employee has a right to a safe working environment, and that obviously includes the home. The employer, however, has a duty to take all reasonable practical measures to ensure that it's safe. Now, what does that mean? Um, there is some statutory definitions that deals with this question. However, our courts have not really gone into it very much. So what we then end up having to do is look to our foreign jurisdictions to understand what have they done in terms of interpreting this question. In this regard, we're quite fortunate that the United Kingdom has had this concept of reasonable practicability for almost a century, and their courts have been considering it quite frequently. What they have indicated is that the concept of reasonable practical does not mean that an employer must do everything possibly physical possible in their means to make an employee safe. It does not mean that they have to uh, buy a completely new house or uh, bring in a ex team of experts in order to make the premises, the home environment completely safe. Um, as what many of us would do if we had a newborn baby and we would have to try and make sure that none of the cupboards can be opened or that sort of thing. No, what is required is that there needs to be sort of a balance, trying to ascertain and balance between what the potential risk is and the potential harm from that risk and the cost in money and time that is going to be required in order to avert that danger. In the event that the danger itself is quite inconsequential, so maybe, maybe something along the lines that someone might fall and hurt themselves, scratch or bruise themselves a little bit, but nothing serious, nothing but a cup of tea won't resolve. Um, in that type of scenario, it would be unacceptable to expect the employer to spend thousands and thousands of rands to 
to avoid that danger. However, in a situation where the risk is quite serious that someone might end up in hospital or might even potentially die, uh, an example that I can give is my boss uh, years ago had a laptop that used to shock him periodically. Um, and then we were told that it was actually quite lucky because it was potentially could have been much worse than a small shock. That is a type of situ situation where the employer might need to intervene to try and avoid that type of danger. And they might need to do something in that particular case, my boss was provided with a different laptop or the laptop had to be repaired. Those are the types of scenarios that we're talking about. So there's, there is going to be a compromise sort of balancing situation that is going to happen here. It's not about a situation that because a person's working from home, they need to receive the best state of the art um, new ergonomic chair. That is not what we're talking about. We need to understand what is the, the, the correct balance that has to be located. What I need to also just point out is that the right to refuse dangerous work is quite important in this regard. So in the event that my boss was to be kept with his laptop and he was regarded as an employee of the firm, which he was, um, and he were to continue working with that laptop and shop, he would have been perfectly entitled perhaps after being informed that it actually can be quite a quite serious shock when it's connected to the main, not working off the laptop battery, that he could have shocked himself quite seriously, he would have been perfectly entitled to refuse to continue using that laptop. And may have then turned around and said, well, he's willing to do everything by hand, whatever might be required. And that needs to be taken into consideration here as well. That is going to be the case at work from home as well. So in a situation where you might have someone who has to bake cookies at home for the local taste neighborhood or home industries, in the event that the, the, the oven itself is problematic, that, that has to be then fixed and resolved. Um, what I think everyone is really interested to know in terms of this work from home scenario is can an employee insist that a COVID-19 positive employee continue working? And this is particularly in the circumstances where the employee is asymptomatic, asymptomatic or possibly they only experience a minimal discomfort and impairment. And in actual fact, they are able to work from home. So uh, let's take an easy example, a lawyer such as myself. Um, in that scenario, even if I were to be COVID positive, my employer can insist that I continue working, provided that it's not going to detriment me uh, in any kind of long-term consequence. If I am asymptomatic, there's no reason in the world why I can't um, deal with my clients and deal with court matters um, through telecommunications, which is what we've been doing. However, a separate question is, can you still insist that that employee continue working when the home environment itself is not safe to do so? And that is where the answer becomes no. The employer cannot insist that the person is going to continue doing their work at home when the home situation itself may give rise to additional dangers over and above the COVID-19. So maybe the person's COVID-19 positive, However, they are baking cookies again and their stove is not working and they then obtain serious third degree burns. If the employer is aware that that is a possibility, they cannot insist the employee continue doing so. What are the home risks that we need to take into consideration? Now, this is a non existent source of list of home risks. This is just examples of these types of things and they come under the various regulations, which is why I would encourage everyone to look at the regulations themselves. I've divided them into three basic categories, infrastructure, environmental and social. Um, some of them are going to be far more complicated to deal with and I'll go over to those in a moment. In terms of the infrastructure, we have, for example, the ergonomics regulations that indicates that there needs to be an adequate workspace Dangerous machinery needs to be looked at very carefully and they need to be ergonomic work systems. So, for example, a person's going to be working with a computer all day, there may need to be take measures taken to ensure that, that person with prolonged work in that environment is not going to develop medical complications such as carpal tunnel syndrome and those types of things. There are also important aspects that we need to consider, such as fire hazards. If you're going to have someone working from cooking from home rather than cooking at your normal kitchen, 
in order to keep the, the work going, you might need to take into consideration, or you will have to take into consideration, things like fire equipment and potentially first aid kits. What is also important is to understand in terms of the infrastructure, we pointed out privacy, but I mean, webcams is a big thing which people have come and asked me about. Yes, a webcam might be a issue that might result in these types of things. An employer might need to just think about that a little bit and decide whether how they're going to deal with it. In terms of the environmental, it's uh, things that you and I might consider quite silly, but they are quite important in terms of an occupational health and safety scenario. For example, a light bulb needs to have a certain luminosity. Um, it, you will see in terms of the regulations, it's quite interesting that the highest luminosity required is for individuals like uh, watchmakers. Now, a watchmaker may well be able to continue their work at home. I understand that many of them frequently do. They need to be ensured that they are provided with adequate lighting in order to do their job properly in a safe manner. Um, whereas a lawyer such as myself doesn't need to have necessarily nearly as a bright lighting. And these are very important aspects and things that need to be considered. Ventilation remains important, even at home. And these things need to be considered. Uh, what is also important to understand from an occupational health and safety aspect is that you can't simply disregard the other legislation simply because it's now something has been produced, maybe baking a cake which is going to be sold in a shop and that cake has been baked at home does not mean that you are no longer bound by the food health and safety regulations and laws. Those are still going to be applicable. So you need to ensure that when you are cooking something at home that you don't accidentally give people food poisoning. That legislation is also going to be in effect and needs to be considered even when working from home. In terms of the social aspects we need, and this is where it becomes far more difficult, we need to start thinking about things such as mental illness. Um, there's been a great um, resurgence of uh, mental health issues relating to the COVID. Um, I suppose all the extroverts are struggling um, and people are really, really not coping. And these are things that employers need to take into consideration. What is also very important is when asking an employee to work from home, they need to take into consideration whether that is going to be compatible with the neighborhood that the person is living in and the situation that they're living in. It would be quite problematic, for example, for a, a liquor store owner, employer, to suggest that someone should maybe take the, the alcohol home with them so they can then sell the alcohol. Not only is that going to be legally permissible because you need particular liquor licenses in order to sell, but it also may cause other untold problems where people are going to become violent in a situation where liquor is being curtailed in terms of the regulations and may not sell, and people might in fact even break in and call commit violence. These are things that need to be considered as well. What also has to be thought about is situations where people are ordinarily working from home. So for example, a domestic worker, a babysitter, we need to think very carefully about how that is going to work. If that can continue or whether that can, and how, if it can continue, how is it going to continue? Those things need to be considered and thought about. And what is most important there is trying to minimize or eliminate the opportunity for social transmission of the disease. Domestic violence is probably the most problematic situation here. And I'm afraid there are no answers to this. There has been a, in, um, up increase in terms of domestic violence that we've incurred and I've encountered with the, the curfews and the work from home scenarios, employers need to be sensitive. I'm not suggesting that they need to solve the problem, but they need to be sensitive to the issues. They need to not make it worse if they are aware that it may make it worse. In terms of the mental health illness issues, uh, it is important to understand that we are a human species or a social species and we need social connection. What is I find frequently interesting and important to understand is that when you look at a uh, substance abuse expert, so uh, those dealing with drug addicts and alcoholics, they frequently explain, and I think this is a great, very, very wise and great deal of wisdom, is that the opposite of substance abuse is social connection. So when we don't get social connection, we slowly slide down into a difficult place. 
and we need to be mindful of that. Employers already have an obligation in order to check in with employees to make sure how they're doing with their COVID, whether there's any symptoms, uh, whether anyone is positive, so in order to report that. I would suggest and recommend that it is also important that at the same time to try and have a bit of interaction with the employees to make sure that they're doing okay, not just in terms of the COVID virus, but also mentally and emotionally they're, they're coping. And if it necessary and if it's possible to try and intervene and assist further if it becomes, if the employer realizes that there's a problem really. I would recommend, in fact, that large organizations should encourage the HR and psychological services to try and make this a core mandate of theirs under this COVID pandemic. Now, obviously, this also requires a large amount of cooperation from the employee. Um, the employee is obligated under our local domestic laws, but as well in terms of our international laws. Um, under the, the Industrial Labour Organization to assist uh, employers in terms of cooperating with them. As you can see, I've indicated in bold on this slide, Article 19A of the One Convention, it basically states that workers are obligated to cooperate with their employer to secure a safe and healthy environment working places. And that is also going to include the home environment. As I've indicated, obviously, we can be mature adults about this and try and work out ways of means to not embarrass anyone, to ensure that they are able to um, keep their privacy as much as possible. But what is foremost important is for the employer to ensure that the employee is safe. We need to be mature about these types of things. And there may be ways to do it that you don't necessarily have to go and do a physical inspection. I think that would be a bit unreasonable in many circumstances. But the information must be imparted. The employer must consider the question and say it's fine or take remedial measures. Just to sort of um, end off, we need just to mention as well the COVID, the quota. Uh, COIDA obviously has implications. Now, our constitutional court has already explained that if someone is injured or dies at home, and this is a particular case dealing with domestic workers, that is applicable to COIDA. So in this particular situation, this domestic worker drowned in an employee's pool while exercising her duties, that is a COIDA matter. Now, we are going to now probably expand and explode that into a variety of different situations, including the baker baking from home, the lawyer working from home, whatever it may be. And we're going to probably have a variety of different scenarios. What is going to be very difficult for us is to understand what is an occupational home injury or disease. The simple answer to this for our purposes is it's not for the employer to decide. What the law requires is that in the event that an occupational injury is reported, whether or not the employer agrees that it is occupational or not, or finds that it is absolutely ridiculous and absurd, provided the injury is quite serious and it's not a trivial thing such as a scratch, the employer is obligated to report it to the Compensation Commission or the relevant mutual insurance entity. And the responsibility for deciding whether it is occupational or not then resides with the commissioner, not the employer. The employer is obligated to simply report it and provide all the information. And I suspect that we are going to find a number of situations and cases that are going to arise where we're going to develop this area of the law. What is important to understand is when thinking about what is it, what is occupational? Our courts have frequently grappled with this issue for a very, very long time. And they've realized that to answer the question, what arose within the scope and course of a person's employment doesn't have a blanket principle answer to. What must happen is that you need to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, a situation may arise where someone is bitten by their dog. And you may think, well, that's certainly not going to be occupational. But when you listen to the facts that we're dealing with it, maybe it transpires that the dog was a rescue dog, it was a new dog, and the person was on the phone getting quite riled with a customer or a supplier, and the dog 
wasn't quite sure and got anxious and bit the work while they were performing something for the purposes of the employer, the commissioner would have to consider that and think about it very clearly whether that is going to constitute an occupational injury or not. And it's not going to be a simple situation. And I suspect that there are going to be cases where the dog bite is going to be maybe considered an occupational injury. And in some cases, no, it won't. So what is important to understand here is that it must be reported, regardless of how silly or ridiculous that you might think it is, and as regardless whether you have doubts, whether the person was in fact providing a role of providing a performance for the employer. That will be for the commissioner to decide and assess based on the best available evidence. In conclusion, it remains the employer's responsibility to conduct a risk assessment at all workplaces, which includes the home. All employees have a right to a safe work environment, which includes a home work environment, but they also are entitled to the right to privacy, which means that there needs to be a balancing act and cooperation in this regard. The responsibility, however, of keeping the employee safe at home continues to be a joint responsibility between the and the employee. I want to echo again the importance of mental illness and again to just emphasize the fact that occupational injuries that are a result from working at home do stall for and avoid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, George Khan, um, was supported by his colleague. Uh, Dr. G. Mudimo, uh, who's a, a PhD in law. I'm going to um, just quickly confirm live uh, with uh, Dr. Jan Lapier, if it's okay that I ask the representatives of the Department of Employment and Labor, that's Mr. Tibor Zana and Ms. Meliratis, if they could perhaps commence with this, is it okay? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lapier. Thanks for that. Um, so Dr. Lapierre has kindly uh, just agreed to swap with our uh, colleagues from the Department of Employment and Labor. We are running slightly late, and so I'll have to uh, give off some of my Q&A session time at the end of um, this particular webinar to Dr. Lapierre for him to have his uh, full 30 minutes of presentation. And I'm sure as attendees, you find this particular webinar very useful and you will give me the leeway and flexibility if I need to go for five or so minutes over our ending time, if that's okay. You can just indicate in the chat box if that's fine with you. In the meantime, um, I just need to remind um, our attendees, please do not um, use the, um, uh, the uh, raise hand function. And I'm going to encourage our presenters who have just completed and those who are about to start, if they could just uh, look at the questions in the questions and answer box. Um, I suspect that Joyce Cow has some issue on her device because her hands keep on raising. I'll just lower it for you, Joyce. Okay. Um, Tidi, please don't raise yours. Ishmael Kasim Daud, please don't raise yours. I've just asked for the raise hands function not to be uh, used. Thank you very much. Please lower your hands. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the Chief Inspector of the Department of Employment and Labor, Mr. Tibor Zana, who from his very busy schedule has taken the time to join us on today's webinar. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Zana just to share his um, presentation slides, um, unless he wants us to share it from the side. Mr. Zana, if you could unmute your microphone. Okay, um, just want to check, is Mr. Tibo Zana there? Um, I see that both Mr. Zana and Ms. Billy Reiters, um, yes, they, I see you've unmuted your microphone, Mr. Zana. Um, are you ready just to share your slides, sir? I'm a bit of a problem uh, from my side with regard to that. Even um, the, okay. uh, the mic now was a problem for me to unrelease. Yes. On this. Would you prefer us to share the slides from our side? I would prefer, thank you. 
And then you could just indicate next slide to my colleague, Glenn. Um, mm -hmm. So let me just double check if I could maybe do it from my side before Glenn does that. Um, Okay, so apologies for the slight delay, colleagues. We are going to um, share the slides for Mr. Tibozana, and I'm just clicking here in the right boxes to find that um, that particular slide. One second. So. <clears throat> There we go. I think I found it. Too many boxes open at the moment. Okay. Right. So um, just indicate if you can share, uh, see the, the slides, and I will also maximize it um, in the meantime. This is Anna. It's visible. Okay. Do you see the full slides? And you can just indicate full to slide. me um, next slide, and I'll move it for you. I hand okay. over to Mr. Tibor Zana. Thank you very much sir, again for joining us today. Uh, Program director, thank you very much for having us. I think uh, this is one of those interesting topics that um, we definitely would like to see developed over the next uh, period of time. Uh, if we can go into the next slide, I'm basically going to be looking purely at the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And the reason for that is uh, the time that's allocated obviously would not be enough for us to do a detailed presentation. I did uh, enjoy the presentation of your uh, previous speaker, and I think it's relevant that we engage uh, in these sort of discussions to start refining the process. Now, from the Department of Employment and Labor side, we have uh, been working with compensation as well as the ILO in order to develop this particular issue so that we can uh, put, a, put into the workplace the necessary policies and, and so on. So this is under discussion and we are working uh, towards uh, finalizing these things. The next slide, Chair. So I do take it that there will be some duplications, obviously, with regard to what was discussed, and there's no doubt about that. My legislation won't cover issues around what an employee is in terms of the BCA. I'm going to look purely at the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and um, bear with me uh, in terms of some of the duplications. And obviously, I'm not going to cover it in the detail that um, might be anticipated. So an employee, very simply then, is any person who is employed by or works for an employer and who receives or is entitled to receive any remuneration or works under the direction or supervision of an employer or any other person. So we need to be clear on the definitions in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And if these issues do find its way to the courts, these are the things that are obviously gonna be considered amongst other uh, piece of policies and so on. Employer then means subject to the provisions of subsection to any person who employs or provides work for any person and remunerates that person who expressly or tacitly undertakes to remunerate them. So the employee employer employer relationship has to be clear in terms of who is going to be affected and why they are uh, are, are being affected. Employment means employed, or employment means employment or employed as an employee. Next slide. And you can see I've taken all the relevant uh, components out. And uh, you will have uh, picked up from the previous slide that we covered risk assessments. I'm glad that that's been done. Hazard uh, means any source of exposure to danger. So whatever's happening around you, let's say within a home environment, these definitions are gonna become quite crucial. Health and safety equipments mean any article or part thereof, which is manufactured, provided or installed in the interest of the health or safety of any person. Healthy means free from illness or injury attributable to occupational causes. An incident means any incident contemplated in section 24. 
which is quite uh, important and we'll see why a little later go on please i've covered that one incident um we've covered that if you could go to the next one premises includes and you heard that from the previous speaker too could even include your car includes any building vehicle vessel train or aircraft and the issue that was touched on early on uh, when reference was made to british law um, is very very important reasonably practicable and i've removed it from some of my extracts um, you can obviously read the legislation for yourself however this is probably one of the most important components and the reason for that uh, will, will be obvious to you. Let's go through it quickly. Means practicable having regard to the severity and scope of the hazard or risk concerned. The state of knowledge reasonably available concerning that hazard or risk and of any means of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk the availability and suitability of means to remove or mitigate, that is to reduce that hazard or risk. And lastly, the cost of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk in relation to the benefits deriving therefrom. Now, this is largely a definition that is not factored into anything, be it appeals, um, be it uh, exemptions, anything that you can think of, this is normally something that is not factored into um, the normal arguments or, or, or discussions that should be taking place around a lot of issues in health and safety. So um, this is something I'd like you to put in the back of your mind as we cover some of the issues that we are going to cover and uh, your previous speaker, of course, uh, did um, uh, pass this particular issue uh, in in um, in his uh, discussion. Next one, uh, remuneration, and then risk. Risk means the probability that injury or damage will occur, and link that, of course, to your risk assessment and the level of risk that you'll, of course, find at home. And um, that is then then it starts to become an important issue. Safe means free from any hazard, of course. Uh, if you can go on, uh, Chair. And uh, here we get to the last bit of it. Work means work as an employee or as a self-employed person. And I want you to focus on the employee. And for such purposes, an employee is deemed to be at work during the time that he or she is in the course of his employment. Now, early on, the previous speaker touched on the BCA. I'm not going to go into the BCA, but there are certain definitions that you need to carry over, uh, such as, for example, an employer will, contri will control the time that you spend at work, uh, any time that you don't spend at work, and injuries that take place, for example, during working hours while you were not performing the work you were required to be performing, those become issues that need to be factored in, of course. You doing things without necessarily involving the employer. And then the discussion obviously starts to heat up. Workplace means any premises or place where a person performs work. And this is also an emphasis by the previous speaker where it was indicated that it is any premises. And you'll see that in terms of the definition it's there, means any premises or place where a person performs work in the course of his or her employment. And it becomes relevant uh, as we go through some of the things I'm gonna cover. I won't go into a lot of detail from some of the things, but we'll have a look at it. Uh, let's go on then. Um, I'm just bringing uh, this particular matter to your attention uh, in relation to listed work. 
Uh, of course, the current Occupational Health and Safety Act 85 of 93 uh, does um, is out currently as a bill, and the time frame for responses is the end of July, um, where comments should be forwarded to myself for consideration. However, uh, there is an area in the Act that could possibly uh, link working from home, and that is section 11 and 12, which refers to listed work, and section 1 sub 2 does cover that aspect. Just uh, for your attention, nothing else. Chair, carry on. Section 8, then, every employee shall provide and maintain, and you have to be aware of, remember that uh, for some people, this is deemed to be a new setup. And while that is the case for some people, for others, this is not necessarily a new environment. Some people have been working from home um, already for quite some time, not even as a result of the pandemic, but as a result of um, agreements between them and the employers. However, it is the first time at the scale of what we are doing it currently, that this has now, um, um, it is now obviously requiring our attention because it has the impact of affecting law as we understand it or the normal uh, side of, of, of what we understand as things being the norm. So uh, over here, you see reasonably practicable. And I want you to, I want to take you back. Every employer shall provide and maintain. It's not just a case of providing, it's a case of also making sure that they do cater for um, the future, the current and the future in relation to health and safety. As far as is reasonably practicable, remember how we were looking at the definition, a working environment that is safe and without risk. And we've looked at the definitions there to the health and safety of employees. Now, we cannot get away from this. We, we are not going to go home and happily uh, carry on our activities as per what we have normally been doing. And I don't want you, want you to be under a false impression that uh, when you go home and you've been allowed to work at home, that you're going to uh, carry on as if um, nothing has changed there is going to be a consideration and you are going to have to um, modify your lifestyles to some extent with regard to what is captured in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Remember there are 22 regulations, while all of them are not necessarily applicable uh, in any one or all of your homes necessarily, some of them will definitely be applicable um, uh, directly, of course. Um, next slide. So as we go on to 8.2 then, we have moved from 8.1, which provides you with an overall view of what is expected by the employer in terms of any person being with, uh, at work um, wherever they are performing that work. Without derogating then from the generality of an employer's duties under what we've just been through, the matters to which those duties refer include in particular the provision and maintenance of systems of work, taking such steps to eliminate or mitigate any hazard or potential hazard to the health and safety of employees before resorting to PPE. Now, I've indicated early on, uh, we looked at section 8.1, uh, we have looked at the definitions and I'm, I'm reminding you that I've removed re reasonably practicable um, to shorten it. However, uh, that will be your task as part of your homework. You can go and read through it and see where reasonably practicable fits in. Next slide. Remember, we are going through section A2, the duties of an employer um, remains and continues. And you'll remember in relation to the risk assessment issue that was raised early on, you need to work with the employer in order to ensure that so everything that needs to be right and in place is in place. Establishing what hazards to the health and safety of persons are attached to any work which is performed in his business and he shall further establish what precautionary measures 
should be taken with respect to such work in order to protect the health and safety of persons and shall provide the necessary means. Now, of course, there is going to be a certain amount of um, uh, handholding that's going to take place. And we are all going to um, uh, be walking the distance in relation to what does this new requirement require from us? Um, can the employer provide everything that is required to provide a safe and healthy work environment? We heard already from the legal side that that would be impractical. So if it is impracticable uh, or impractical, to what extent will the court go in finding that that uh, impractical uh, side of things uh, was in fact, um, uh, it, it required modification in terms of the way we think of, of things as being practical. So there is still a duty, of course, to establish what those hazards are, to establish what precautionary measures should be taken. And then there must be something that says, um, this is how we are going to, of course, deal with those issues. And together, we're going to have to walk uh, that distance. So the employee, uh, given the new circumstances, all of us, including those employees, are going to learn from each other what exactly this new environment is. And in some cases, of course, we are going to learn the hard way. Uh, providing such information, which is what the employer can do, instructions and training. And uh, of course, the, the, the last part of it is uh, what form will supervision take in relation to you working from home because of uh, naturally uh, working from home doesn't mean that you're not going to be supervised in terms of the performance of the work that you are required to perform and we'll see that there are other aspects that relate to it so the um, uh, the employer is going to try and obviously um, uh, assist you in making it easier for you to operate in an environment at your own uh, obviously at the employer's expense, because even changing the way that you have been doing your business is going to come at a cost. So we, we will naturally look at how this has been done and uh, look at how we can influence these things uh, across the board. Not permitting any employee to do any work unless, of course, those precautionary measures are uh, followed. Uh, next slide, Chair. Um, and then the employer furthermore is required to take all necessary measures to ensure that the requirements of this act are complied with by every person in his or her employment or on premises under his control. And that part I'm not going to uh, focus on, but by every person in, in his employment. So taking all the necessary measures to ensure that the requirements of the act are complied with. Now, in order to do that, the employer would need to work with you as an employee in your so-called new work environment in order to address the matter. And uh, from the outset, um, the advice that I've been given, giving rather, uh, is that when you're working at home, it would be preferable for you to uh, allocate an area in which or within which you are going to work and uh, you will have an agreement, uh, if that is possible, of course, with your employer, that that area then becomes your place of work at your workplace. Now, not all of us have that luxury, and um, uh, that, that would be a, a, an added complication in some people's families. However, if you're able to do it, I think it would be an advantage. So um, the... You as an employee, it would be in your best interest. And this is where a lot of employers and employees are striking heads uh, in relation to this working from home. Um, let me further state that it's not a must that an employer must let you work from home. If the employer can accommodate all his or her workers at the workplace, then nothing stops those employers from being uh, uh, those employers from accommodating uh, workers at the workplace. Of course, to cut down on the impact of uh, spreading the virus, 
one of those things would be to allow workers to work at home. But um, if the employer was to create the environment uh, where the infection obviously can be cut down totally or in its entirety, it would be to the advantage uh, of everyone concerned. So uh, let's say, as we have agreed up to now that the employer does allow you to work at home, then uh, you have to then, in my opinion, come and meet the, the employer halfway in order to allow the employer uh, to do what is required in terms of the law, because at the end of the day, the employer still carries the can in terms of the, the Occupational Health and Safety Act for ensuring that you are in an environment that is healthy and safe um, in terms of how the, uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act is structured. And of course, the employer is required to enforce such measures as may be necessary in the interest of health and safety as the bottom line at the end of the day, both with this piece of legislation as well as with the current direction that was published in June 2021, uh, the last one that is. So we are, uh, at the end of the day, operating in an environment where the employer still has a responsibility uh, towards the employee. However, um, the employee is required also to make sure uh, in terms of section 14 that they comply with all that the employer is um, requiring from EMOA. If you can go on, Chair. Um, if you can carry on, this uh, people can read on their own. Um, just something that is, uh, that is quite important, and I think it was raised earlier as well. Section nine, the general duties of employers and self-employed. However, uh, we are interested in ensuring that the activities of your employer, which, can't, which uh, includes your activities, does not impact on those around you. Um, and early on, it was also raised around the possibility of infecting others uh, or yourself, in fact, becoming infected at home and how that could impact on the work uh, or your work performance um, and, and uh, the relationship between you and your employer. So every employer shall conduct his or her undertaking in such a manner as to ensure, as far as is reasonably practicable, that persons other than those in his or her employment who may be directly affected by his activities are not thereby exposed to hazards to the health or safety. So some of these things don't fall away. You still have to be mindful of it, and you still have to ensure that you're complying with the requirements of the, of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, carry on, please. General duties of employees at work then, in terms of section 14, every employee shall at work take reasonable care for the health and safety of himself and of other persons who may be affected by his or her act or omissions. As regards any duty or requirement imposed on his employer or any other person by this act, cooperate with such employer or person to enable that duty or requirement to be performed or complied with. So again, I come back to the issue that you're going to have to work with your employer in order to ensure that the employer uh, is seen to be fulfilling his or her obligations in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Carry on. Carry out any lawful order given to him or her and obey the health and safety rules and procedures laid down by his, by his employer or by anyone authorized there to by his employer. And here again, uh, of course, it's in the employer's best interest to set the framework within which uh, work from home is going to take place. This is something that I've indicated you are required in terms of the current direction and even the legislation to have um, a policy uh, in place. And uh, one of the things the direction requires for you to include the whole issue around risk. And now it's further pushed you to have something in relation to vaccinations included in that as well. So it's, uh, it is obviously important then that uh, employers document every aspect around working from home 
uh, as far as it is within his or her power to do so, naturally, if there are things that are not considered, um, these, these aspects would be tested under the, uh, the criteria set by reasonably practicable as defined. If any situation which is unsafe or unhealthy comes to his attention, as soon as practicable report such situation to his employer for health and safety rep for his workplace or section thereof, as the case may be, we shall report it to the employer. Again, working with your employer, how can you get rid of certain aspects that you might not be clear on? You might be a single parent and you might not have all the uh, uh, answers reasonably available to you um, in terms of you uh, sharing information with others. Uh, so it, in, in my opinion, it would be good for an employer to create an environment in which um, uh, you know, these aspects can be shared and uh, thereafter the employer can obviously cover gaps that might be appearing in relation to working from home. Next slide, please. If he's involved in any incident which may affect his or her health or which has caused an injury to himself or herself, report such an incident to his employer or her employer or to anyone authorized there to by the employer or to his or her health and safety rep as soon as practicable, but not later than the end of a particular shift during which the incident occurred. So quite important again, work with your employer on these issues. Uh, and be straight uh, with your employer about these things because um, at the moment things are beginning to creep out of the woodwork and employers are being, beginning to see uh, the negative side of employees working from home. And these are the questions that I'm now beginning to pick up from employers and the legal fraternity in terms of what is acceptable and what's not in relation to uh, working from home. Next slide, Chair. Section 20 then, uh, you will have a health and safety committee. Remember, even though you have a part, uh, maybe a part of your workplace that is still open and operating, you are ever have been given permission to work from home. The health and safety committee, and I wanted to drive this point home, you have health and safety reps, health and safety reps, are going to be keeping an eye on what's taking place. And then the Health and Safety Committee is not exempt. Of course, you will notice that the uh, current direction refers, refers back to or reverts to the Health and Safety Committee, the Health and Safety representatives, as well as organized labor or your trade unions uh, that ought to get involved in certain respects with regard to uh, Health and Safety Acts health and safety activities. So uh, I've tried to highlight the important point here, your health and safety committee. And in uh, a number of instances, in terms of our inspections that we are having, we are still finding employers that do not have active health and safety structures at their workplaces. Despite us having the environment that we have, your health and safety structures have not been excused from operating and providing the type of leadership and guidance and communication that is required to ensure a safe and healthy workplace. Health and safety committee may make recommendations to the employer or where the recommendations fail to resolve the matter to an inspector regarding any matter affecting the health and safety of persons at the workplace or any section thereof, which such committee has been established shall discuss any incident at the workplace or section thereof in which or in consequence of which any person was injured, became ill or died and may in writing report on the incident to an inspector shall, be, shall perform such other functions as may be prescribed. So in a nutshell, I've tried to let you see that your activities of your committee are very important and that it is in your best interest to keep them active and continuing uh, as to with where you have a compliance officer as, as, as required by the uh, 
uh, current COVID directions set out by the Department of Employment and Labor, where um, your compliance officer is also involved in monitoring and ensuring compliance. Next slide, Chair. Um, so in terms of section 24, uh, you'll notice all this activities that are highlighted, the type of injuries that could take place. Next slide, Chair. Next slide, Chair. And then you see that sub two also refers, uh, taking you from 24.1, 24.2. Uh, next slide, Chair. The uh, people can read through this on their own. I'm sure they're aware of it. Next slide. Uh, and then we get to the part in the act that talks uh, to the following aspect. So despite the following issues have, uh, having been raised, the provisions of subsections one and two, which I've shown you, shall not apply in respect of an incident occurring in a private household, provided that, provided that the householder forthwith reports the incident to the South African police. So by inference, this is looking at um, house uh, or home related activities that could be reported, but uh, instead of you reporting it in this case to the directly to the Department of Employment and Labor, uh, you go to the South African police because there's a fatality or whatever the case is. Or, and this is quite important, a member of the SAPS to whom an incident was reported in terms of subsection 3B shall forthwith notify an inspector thereof. So this is quite important that obviously the SAPS needs to be, uh, needs to ensure that when issues get reported, that they also get reported directly to um, the inspector immediately. So uh, what I'm saying to you today is we are going to amend the bill to make it that you report directly um, um, uh, that there are incidents that you report directly uh, within your home environment uh, where there's a, a, um, a workplace related injury of whatever sort. Given that the domestic workers are now included in COIDA, they were never excluded from the Occupational Health and Safety Act, but we'll make sure that we uh, clearly indicate that you need to report those issues now going forward. Go forward, please. Um, so this is just section 31 in terms of incident investigations. I'm not gonna go into it. Chair, if you can move on. And then uh, as I get to the end of my presentation then Chair, I just want to remind um, the, the attendees of the following. The health and the existing structures that are required to operate will continue operating. I have not touched on uh, the legislation uh, uh, in the details that would be required. And I'm glad that the previous speaker from a legal point did. Uh, your ergonomic side, of course, is quite an important area and will provide guidance and leadership on that. Uh, there is a guide note out with that document that can assist you as well. And uh, when you're looking at um, anything that relates to psychological matters, that is included in the ergonomics regulations. And of course, it's a factor that we'll look at um, and provide the necessary guidance on in the detail required going forward. However, with the publication of our first ergonomics regulations, we have set the foundation uh, for um, uh, employers and employees uh, at the workplace, and we will, uh, we will continue uh, growing that area moving forward. Um, the existing structures, uh, as I pointed out to you, please make sure that they are operating fully and it's the employer's duty to make sure that they are doing what is required of them uh, under the current circumstances. While they're not involved in uh, providing guidance and offering uh, recommendations to the employer, this is a major problem, I would imagine, and it's something that you need to address. 
Next slide, please. Consent of employees and the legality of that consent. Of course, uh, we all know that uh, this particular way that we are working is up in the air uh, with a little bit of uh, um, um, a legal footprint that we have in this area. Uh, we will obviously look at the courts developing that matter even further. Uh, we have heard earlier that uh, the, the, the courts itself uh, take each case on its merits, and therefore it would be important that, uh, that we see how this develops over time going forward. Um, are we stretch stretching things a bit legally? Uh, that remains to be seen. And obviously, a law uh, grows over time. It's not something that is uh, that is there, and uh, we have the luxury of going to it and and relying on it. We we obviously uh, rely on the legal uh, knowledge of those around us to provide us with the necessary um, uh, leadership and guidance. Um, of course, as I've indicated, not. Um, over and over, time will be the judge of uh, whatever's taking place at the moment. Have we learned any lessons from 1918? Um, again, we'll see as we go forward because 1918 took place and when 2020 came around, it was like a surprise to all of us, despite uh, some of the activities that have been um, in play globally since 2016 around these issues. So uh, each day we learn and we'll see how we uh, provide the leadership and guidance um, within um, uh, the, the, the borders of South Africa as well. We'll see how we can assist our people in um, moving forward from this particular uh, period in time that we find ourselves in. Next slide. Um, this is an area I'm not going to go much into it, although there is a lot of concern that uh, the, the Constitution provides uh, the necessary protection for people um, who are at home. However, where consent is given by an employee in regard to uh, employers allowing them to work at home, the implications of that uh, we have yet to see. So uh, that is something that we'll naturally uh, keep an eye on going forward. Chair, next one. I've been on this one already, if we can go on. Uh, Chair, I think uh, I've said my say, uh, as, I, as I've indicated at the beginning, uh, 30 minutes to cover such an important topic, uh, quite an important one, of course. Um, We've done what we can in relation to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and we look forward to working with everyone involved in the space uh, and, and also in developing things that is to the best interest of all uh, in ensuring that workers uh, continue to work in a healthy and safe working environment. Uh, and even here in this case, uh, Chair, I think it's important that we're taking health and safety directly to our homes uh, where we can influence uh, the communities around us with regard to health and safety. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. That's the Chief Inspector, Mr. Tibo Zana. Thank you for taking the time um, and also to stepping into the breach, uh, given that uh, uh, we had some challenges with regard to preparation. Um, I now quickly hand over to Ms. Millie Reiters. She's the Chief Director for medical services at the compensation fund who's going to complete this particular presentation um, if you could just open your microphone and do i move on the slides for you Ms. Raiders? good uh, morning um Chairperson and to all the participants including mr zana i will try and share my screen um I'm trying to share my screen. You will indicate to me if you are able to see my screen. We can see that you, yes, if you could maximize it, Ms. Raiders, that would be perfect. 
and you indicated that you'll focus on some of the key important slides. Just give me a second. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm um, not going to do the whole slides because I'm sharing with um, Mr. Zah. But what I would like to just touch on, I'm just going to touch on the last few slides so that we don't go over your time because we were supposed to share the the 30 minutes. So I just would like to, to, to talk to this particular matter on slide number seven of my slides, which speaks to legal aspects of compensation as well as our adjudication and uh, why we are currently covering COVID-19 is and we see that there's uh, in the COID Act, it speaks to acquired out of employment. And this is where an employee must have been involved in a task for which he or she was uh, contractually employed to perform when the disease was contracted. And then acquired in the course of employment, uh, that must have been contracted during the periods or uh, her duties or any other duties that is related to the employer's business. And then it's important for us to look at this acquired out of employer because if you look at our um, legislation for COVID-19, we are not supposed to cover employees that for instance, contract COVID-19, uh, let's say it's in a, in in an office setup, somebody contracted COVID-19 and we then, um, as the fund would not cover that, but we would, for instance, cover your COVID-19 or any disease, for instance, for a healthcare worker where they've acquired an occupational disease or an occupational injury that is acquired out of the employment or acquired in the course of the employment. So this is very important. I'm going to skip some of... Um, the slides, and then I'm going to go straight into the working from home. Uh, with regard to working from home, uh, I wanted to speak to a little bit about COVID-19 and what we do and what we cover. And uh, also with regard to working from home, we do take a strict stance. If somebody have acquired, for instance, COVID-19 whilst they were working from home and they were not exposed to any clients, then we would most likely as the fund, we will uh, go through the case, but chances of us based on our processes that I wanted to explain within most probably, I'm not saying we will, but most probably based on the information available, then uh, repudiate a claim. But when it comes to COIDA and uh, working from home, if you look at uh, the COVID-19 regulations that we have issued and we've received key questions from uh, quite a significant amount of stakeholders and there is a need for us between ourselves and uh, the um, uh, Mr. Zana's unit to then come up with some form of notices or even regulations that relate to, to working from home. So with uh, COVID-19 and working from home in COIDA, we did get a legal opinion and our legal services was involved in the process. So um, our act currently does not have a def definition of a workplace, and uh, therefore we rely on the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and we utilize the their definition of, of a of a workplace. So the question that has been asked is, what constitutes a workplace, and uh, will we then, as the compensation fund, cover um, occupational and diseases acquired whilst working from home. So Mr. Zana did speak to section one and where a uh, workplace is any premises or place where it says any premises or place where a person performs work in the course of his or her employment. Remember what I said up there with regard to in the course of employment. And then the employee, uh, then that are working from home if they are performing um, this particular work, we as the compensation fund, based on our legal opinion that we have received, will then uh, 
uh, be able to then adjudicate the claim. And then ultimately, we will then have to compensate for that claim. But based on everything that Mr. Zana has said, it is important for us, as well as the employers, to, 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 to do some spade work with regard to this particular matter of us compensating for when an injury occurs at work. And there is duties of the employer, but there's also duties of the employee. And that is why the OHS portion plays a very important role for us to be able to then make sure that when we adjudicate a claim and we accept liability for the claim, that it was really due to an employee performing the duties that have been assigned to them when they contracted the occupational disease uh, or the, the occupational injury. Therefore, a workplace is deemed to be a place when employees performing work, which is in the course of his and her employment. And therefore, the work from home is deemed as a workplace if the employee performs his or her work in the course of his and her employment. Therefore, an employer can then submit a claim through to the compensation fund. But it's in order for us to then finally make a decision on it on this particular claim and to accept liability, there is some work that needs to be done from the inspectorate. The challenge that uh, we have, and I think Mr. Zana has also alluded to this particular one, is that the inspectorate, uh, when it comes to entering a home in terms of uh, section 27, uh, section 24, uh, they, 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 they cannot just access a private household and therefore the incident must be reported to the SAPS uh, and uh, the, um, the inspector then subsequently needs to be informed. And this might pose a bit of a challenge uh, because for us, we would then need the inspector to be actively involved in the cases where we need to adjudicate on a claim ultimately pay medical expenses, compensation benefits related to injuries and diseases contracted um, at work. And um, because of time constraints, I'm not going into too much detail because uh, I think we've taken up more than the business between Ms. Zana and myself. So as a way forward, uh, with regard to COVID-19 post the national state of disaster, as indicated, we've made a special concession where we are covering COVID-19, uh, even if it's not in the, in, the, in the course of the employment, but if there is a contact that is traced in the, in the employment or in the workplace, then we are currently covering uh, COVID-19. Uh, but post the national state of disaster, we we would then revert back to our direction will then not be applicable anymore, the direction that was signed by the, the minister. And we would then, for instance, not cover COVID-19, but there are talks between us and organized business, organized labor looking into this particular matter. Then with regard to um, the regulations for work from home, uh, that it is important that between the IES inspectorate and all the relevant key role players, even at a level of organized business, organized labor, and maybe academia, we need to be able to finalize regulations or notices related to this particular matter. So with that said, uh, Chair, I tried to just get the gist of the compensation fund that um, currently we, an employer can send through a claim for somebody that worked from home that contracted an occupational injury or disease. But when it comes to our adjudication, it is going to be a bit difficult if it's not clear cut and we are going to need the assistance of the inspectorate. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Mali Reiters, the Chief Directorate for um, um, is it medical services at the compensation fund? And thank you very much also for availing yourself at the very last minute to join us here today. I understand that your time is pressed, but we will look forward to uh, future updates if that's okay with yourself and the chief inspector to join us again. Ms. Reiters, thank you very much for your uh, contribution.
Okay, so now I'm going to, without much further ado, hand over to Dr. Jan Laper, who's going to speak on the employer-employee duties with regard to occupational health and safety in the working from home scenario. Um, I'm going to immediately hand over to Dr. Lapierre. I think you may have to unmute uh, Dr. Lapierre. Good morning, Ashraf. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. It's uh, maximized. Please proceed. Thank you. Morning. Um, thank you um, for having me this morning. Um, I think after two NQF level eight discussions, you'll have to bear with me at the, at the lower NQF level. I'd, I'm trying to make it practical. Um, and also, um, I see from the questions that um, some of the slides may be useful to you um, in, as, as a practical matter. Um, I'm also not going to address too many things other than health and safety in terms of, of the working from home, um, but we, we will just shortly, shortly go on the agreement because I see there's a lot of questions as to how this can actually occur. Um, the, um, We'll have four, four chapters this morning. Um, first of all, you know, wh why do we work from home? Um, this is not the standard working from home. Um, in Europe, in, in the 60s and the 70s, there, were, there was a lot of textile work done from home. Um, this is something totally different. We're looking at, at specifically in terms of the COVID epidemic. Um, then determining whether and how working from home can be instituted. It doesn't go automatically. Now, a lot of questions were raised about this. Then a, a brief occupational health and safety risk assessment, not quite as good as that one of George, but just practical points that we've noticed in, 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 uh, in the past 18 months. And then advice to employees who work from home, just some practical slides that you can be using. So if we're looking at working from home, it's a general containment at the employer. Evidently, God forbid we go to level five, then you know, those that can work from home must work from home. That's the only way you can work. But for the rest, um, you know that the director of the Department of Labor requires employers to send as many employees home as possible. This is contrasting with international law, for instance, in the Netherlands, it's, it's, it's the other way around. Everybody must work from home unless you can prove that it's different, that, that it's not required. So we, we leave a, a risk-based solution to the employer in terms of COVID. Um, then evidently all the vulnerable employees that we don't want to expose to the masses at the workplace can also be placed at, at home and, and working from home is kind of their solution uh, to being to being able to to level their income and psychosocial needs versus the the biological biological risk of COVID nineteen, and then obviously a question that came back too you know what about people who have to go into quarantine quarantine except quarantine emanating from a, a work a work acquired close contact is not paid for under the basic conditions of employment so you know people say well I'm in quarantine can I work from home because I can continue with my work. And some people even under isolation would like to continue working from home. Um, I, I, I didn't know what the other colleagues were going to talk about in terms of law, um, but I did still sneak in one little slide on, on working from home and the law. And, um, and there's two references there at the bottom, which are interesting to read. Um, the uh, Labor Relations Act uh, uh, definition of a workplace looks at a collective at a collective definition. So it says where the employees of an employer work. And there's, there was a, um, a, a labor court case um, where um, it was determined that it's difficult for the Labor Relations Act employer's duties to be executed at the workplace. Um, if somebody works from home and he drinks a beer, if that happened at a factory, it would be unlawful and it would be, it is dictated in general safety regulations that the employer must take action for that. It's difficult to determine that in, at the home place. But the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, is quite clear. Um, and as, as uh, Mr. Zana um, indicated, we, we, we safe that, that home can be a workplace within the definition. Um, and then my stance on this was, um, like Mr. Zana, is that 
uh, how 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 uh, penetrating is an employer into an employee's home? I'm the boss as an employer at my workplace. I determine what measures are put in place and I'm in control of those measures and I must put the resources in place for those measures. That doesn't linearly apply to work, but where you look at the, the liability for health and safety and, and that re, that's the same to the employer and the employee, um, there, there is a clause that, def, that defines that the availability and the suitability of the means to remove and or mitigate a hazard is what reasonably practicable defines. So um, at this stage, we, we all agreed with the two, the three previous speakers that um, Churchill Adagio that never let a crisis go to waste is can be applied here because we can have a large legal amendments um, that have to come into place specifically to address this matter. But I don't think we can be frozen until then. Um, to me, an employer will have to make sure that the employee works at, at the home and that home will be a workplace for the employer and the employer will have to reasonably practicable, be, be reasonably practicable to ensure that that workplace is safe. And I'm gonna work on that a little bit further. So the first one is that you, you have to determine whether and how working from home may be instituted. And so th there's factors there's employee factors, there's employer factors, and there's, there's a, a lot of common factors. So the employee factors, does the employee agree to work from home? Because um, it's, it's a change of employment. You can say, well, the law says you, you must work from home, but our law, as I said earlier, is not quite as prescriptive as some of the other countries. So, so the employee's conditions of employment will be changed and there needs to be some form of negotiation on that one. Um, does the employee have sufficient adequate physical space and facilities at home? You know, your, some of your employees might might live in shacks, unfortunately, in South Africa, and that's not probably not the good place to go to go home to and to do laptop work. Is the home environment sa a safe work environment? And then, evidently, you now introducing your workplace into a, a big social community family environment. Is that is that something that the employee really wants to do? I love George's first picture, for those of you that started on time, um, that is really common. A kitchen table with both mom and dad working from home and the children going to school every second day. So everybody vies for the laptop or for whatever electronic equipment there is. The, 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 the Wi-Fi is not sufficient. So there is a big, a big social uh, impact of that. Common factors are, you know, you need to define where is the home. Um, I've got uh, a Belgian friend who's a CEO of a, of a famous Belgian praline factory, and he spends his time in his home in Port Elizabeth. Um, and that's his home, although I think his shareholders may think that he's sitting somewhere in Brussels. Um, what part of the house will be considered a workplace? There was a very, a very important question by somebody raising um, you know, what if something happens in the kitchen? Is, that now, is it now considered an IUD? So I think you, you need to discuss this and you need to debate this. Um, is there sufficient security? A very important aspect. You know, a lot of houses haven't seen fancy electronic equipment or fancy any other equipment to go into there. Now suddenly, you know, that house may be a target. Um, hours of work, when must you be available? Because su suddenly you're at home, the boss can phone anytime. Um, are there overtime arrangements if you work overtime? Um, what's the homework? Listing of the work assignments, the due dates, the work expectations. There's no more day-to-day, minute-by-minute talking to each other anymore. Um, the hardware requirements, um, the questions were raised about this. M must the desk and the chair be, be, be supplied by the employer? Well, you need to negotiate this. If you're going to sit me on a chair, all day long to do my work and on a desk to do all, all day long to do my work. It must conform to a certain standard. I'm going to try within time to go through that standard. I've got it in the PowerPoint here. Software requirements, also questions asked, you know, who, who must pay for, for the electronic uh, linkage? Well, if you're a seamstress, um, you need to get electricity for your sewing machine and if you work from home. But if, if you're a, so, so a person using electronic equipment, then that, that, that electronic link must, must be provided by the employer and must also be paid for by the employer. 
but it, it mustn't be used to sit and watch YouTube and, and Netflix. It must be used for work. So it's a bilateral agreement. Then also very, very important communication. Um, you know, a whole lot of communication is required. Suddenly you've got your IT at home. You can't phone the chap from IT to come and fix something, but he still needs to be there because otherwise you're stuck in work. Similarly, with, with, with questions that you may have, have to ask. Uh, and similarly for the employer, wants to phone you and then you don't answer your phone, what alternative numbers are there? So that's an important aspect to look at. Travel and driving requirements. Um, some of you may know that COIDA doesn't accept, uh, normally accept traveling to and from work as being, um, as, as being part of, of your work duties that are covered under COIDA, except under special circumstances where a, a vehicle driven by the employer is specifically used for this. But now if there's ad hoc driving up and down, it may be between branches or between places, suddenly working from home can also include driving. And then um, what, what both OSHAC and COIDA require is that there's clear control on driving modes and driving routes. Um, so that's, that's another aspect that one must have a look at because it's no longer as if the employee might be just coming to work. Um, then incidents and injuries, we raised this already. Um, the, um, I was hoping that COIDA was going to give us um, may, maybe a few examples, but you know, if, you, if you read the literature, um, you will find that um, the, the same word that's used in our COIDA remains, it remains very important. It's the nexus between what you do and the incident that happened. So you'll read that, for instance, there's an Australian case where the Australian employer required the employee to have a security gate at their gate so that the, the computer wasn't going to be stolen. And it, the, the, the security gate was left open by a child. The employee came down the staircase and fell down the staircase whilst going to close the security gate. And, and the compensation, they said, well, that was part of the, of the employee's job, although he tripped over his, his own carpet. And, and so, um, but be that as it may, the, the most important part is not the, the facts of the case. The most important part now, when we're setting this up, is that there's a reporting, a reporting duty, an immediate reporting duty, a possibility of doing an investigation. Um, also, in that, if the employer gives you equipment, you will be held responsible for that equipment. So if, if your child decides to pour a cup of coffee over that computer, you might be liable for that. So it's important that that is discussed up front. And um, we, we don't have enough money to cover everything. So this is what insurance is for. So one should be looking at, if you say to me, here's the laptop and you're responsible for it, there should be some insurance taken out so that in case of damage, it's covered. Um, then also when you initiate it, is this now for goods? Is it for a trial period? At whose behest do I come home and not come home? Um, you know, for some people working from home was a, was a relief, for instance, on cost on, on, on looking after children and they gave up contracts and then suddenly the employer decides now you must come back again and now they must get back into the creches. So, so it, it needs to be determined up front. Key performance areas, this is outside occupational health and safety, but key performance areas must be remained, must, must be in place. Um, and then also, you know, very important, the employee must not be isolated. So there must still be the same notices, the same updates, the, the, same, the same communication, so that you don't put this employee on an island out there. Um, there already are, as we're going to see, enough psychosocial hazards. And then there's employer factors. Um, the employer has to agree to allow certain employees to work from home. There may be technical measures by which somebody that does office work at work all day still cannot go home. So, so that, that probably is a prerogative of the employer to decide. Certainly in South Africa, it is, as I said earlier on, not in other countries where, where it's been mandatory to work from home. Um, then also, can the employee's tasks be performed to the required standard? Um, is it be, is going to be a full-time or part-time? So maybe a few days a week. That's also been arrangements that have been made. And then those same arrangements that we set up just now um, as on, on the employer side. Um, those common factors have got two sides of it. There's an employee side and employer side to it. Certainly the setting up cannot be just saying, pack your bags and go home. If you do it like this, you are, you are making sure that there's going to be trouble thereafter. Um, as I said, uh, the working from home is mostly administrative, but it can also be 
fine assembly work at home, seamstress work, textile work. There's plenty of other activities that can be done from home. Um, so if we go to the occupational health and safety risk assessment in practice here, I, I didn't look at the three factors that George looked at. Uh, George is very academic and quite, quite comprehensive, and I, I'd like to use this slide in future. Um, I looked at physical factors, things that can happen physically, and at psychosocial factors. Um, and the physical factors, um, the two most common things that, that go wrong is driving and uneven surfaces. For some reason, you know, we are an unstable nation. So people falling at home seems to be the most, the most common injury that happens. Obviously, whatever task is being asked to be done, the ergonomics of that task are important. I've seen somebody injuring their back carrying the boxes of paperwork that had to be captured. Um, so that needs to be that it needs to be pro properly uh, properly assessed in the risk assessment of the um, of the working for home, workstation ergonomics. I'll cover that in a minute. A very important aspect if, if workstations are, are there, air quality, uh, noise elimination. George raised the, the fact how, how much lighting they need, and then also fire safety, uh, electrical safety. We'll address that, and then security. Very important aspect there. Um, whilst these are, 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 are now and then happening, and if you look at the claims, they, they are the biggest claims, but the psychosocial factors are actually prevailing. They, they're nearly never missing. You know, when you're sitting at home, you isolate it. Um, you, 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 you leave rostering. In many, many instances, what happens is the rostering falls away altogether. And um, just before mom goes to bed, she quickly goes to check if there's no late emails, which the server sends through. So, so you, you find that the, the clear definition of work stop, work stop is often lost in there. Um, space constraints, George's picture was the, was the epitome of that. Uh, summary, we're dealing with children, with multiple partners uh, and students working from home, working on each other's nerves, increased of family violence, um, work-life imbalance, because now um, you, know, you wanna go for a run, but you don't want to have your cell phone to go off whilst you're going for a run or your boss is phoning you. And albeit that you're going to work way into the dark tonight, um, it's not going to be nice if they catch you running between two and three, or if somebody sees you at the spa at, uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then obviously, when you're sitting far away from the, from the coal face, um, if you're a person that wants to grow, your, your, your professional progression and development may feel impaired or may be impaired. So what advice do we give to employees who work from home? Um, and, and here, here are, are the, these are now really just little practical things which we issue to our, our employees. Um, for instance, security, um, we say to employee, your home is generally safe. You, you must verify the following in your risk assessment of your home. You know, your home is generally safe and working there is no exposure to violence. If that's not the case, it needs to be addressed. Being at home doesn't pose risk for a tax burglary or holds ups and your equipment and, and documents are not visible to unwanted persons you're sitting, sitting in your garden outside in a busy street. Your home security is sufficient to prevent all unauthorized entry and also confidentiality can be maintained. Your, your home is not the church gathering every one night a week and everybody's reading all the company documents. Your emergency arrangement, you must make sure there's a planned escape route in case of fire and that the exit path is reasonably direct. Um, you have a list of emergency numbers. I'm giving an example of that. Um, during your working hours, your direct managers can be contacted and you know the company procedure um, for reporting to you. Your working area has sufficient ventilation, lighting and heating, or cooling to enable you to work safely, your computer work, your computer area doesn't make you stay straight in the light or on a, on a, on a, on a light with a, on which the sun shines. Um, you know, heaters, very important. Heat, heaters call, cause burns and cause fire. Um, your floors even and clear from tripping hazards such as extension cords, rugs or loose carpets. Um, you're not exposed to excessive noise. You have suf sufficient space to work and to put everything on. The kitchen table might not be ideal. So you, you might need a, a, some, some type of home office. And then, um, you know, your, your, your work area must be separated from other areas um, where, where more hazardous things occur. Um, stress, identifying your risk assessment that you're sufficiently separated from disruptions such as pets and children to avoid repeated stressful disruption. 
Um, you have regular contact with your manager supervisor. You have, you have access to IT or anybody in HR or anybody that needs to resolve your work-related matters. Um, and then you also important is when you, when you set a, a bunch of people home, you must have some form of EAP service or some EAP contact or somebody that can just talk when the stress is too much. We discussed the stress comes from many as different aspects. Electrical safety. If you run a house, whoever owns that house must have an electrical certificate of compliance. If that isn't in place, you must tell me. And as an employer, you might have to take a reasonably practical uh, solution to that. You know, some people have electricians who are part of their maintenance team who can go and inspect if that's required. Um, there's an earth leakage unit. I've got a few examples of inspections for that for the employees. There's no damage to electrical equipment. You don't overload a socket. We advise that you, if you buy a, a multi-plug, get one with a, a safety circuit in it. Um, and then also make sure that your extension leads and all, all, all the equipment that you bought are in their natural state and not fixed with checkers, paper bags, plastic bags. Your workstation and your computer. Um, and here we've got a little, a little question here. Um, at, again, at the onset and at a risk assessment, we kind of mix up the setup and the risk assessment with these documents that we're going through now is um, there must be comfortable leg space at the workstation, a foot rest, if, you, if your legs are too short, must be a comfortable chair, um, the heights and the viewing distance of your computer, your monitor and keyboard, your telephone, you know, if, if you're going to be on the telephone for a long time, you need some form of headset or, or something that can assist you not to have to have a cramp in your arm. Then work practices, your work requirements at home allow you to adopt, adopt and maintain a safe work posture. Any physical work you do must be like lifting and carrying or pushing, must be within your physical capacity. And then also um, we're looking at your work planning. You know, your day still has to be planned um, with alternatives, with breaks, with coffee breaks, with intervals that are that at intervals that are required. Driving, you can't just climb in your car if it's going to be for work. You know, driving when driving is, is required, it's going to have to be the shortest and the safest route. And if you can't do that, you must sure that you know you have some form of contact at, at the work where an alternative route can be discussed. Then COVID. You know, employees have to remain informed about the COVID symptoms, the social distancing requiring the non-formal principles, remember that nothing has changed. The, the, the employer's duty in terms of COVID remain the same at home. So um, I, I would strongly advise that daily screening or daily reporting of screening remains in place, um, that any symptoms, any symptoms that occur whilst at work, albeit at home, are still being uh, reported to the COVID compliance officer. So whether you're at work or you at work at the workplace or you're at work from home, the same COVID rules apply. Um, and, and it's important that you emphasize this in this epidemic. Um, and then I've got, in conclusion, I've got a few, a few little uh, documents, which here's a, an example of, you know, um, an emergency number display that you can give your employee. Um, here is a computer checklist for safe seating at a workstation. I'm not gonna go through the ergonomics of a, of, a, of a safe workstation, but this is the classical ergonomic assessment of the seating at a workstation, of the work, uh, the work posture at the work at the workstation, of the positioning and use of the keyboard and the mouse at the workstation, the positioning of the screen, so they, they can check this out. Um, then there's another checklist for safe tasking at home um, in terms of um, using telephone, um, the work posture, uh, eye strain, the 2020 technique is defined in here. Um, and um, then there's a, another one that you can use, for instance, is on your electrical. You know, so it's just a, a, a two page electrical checklist. This is per, first pages. Check your DV board, little picture of, of a DV board. This is, this is what it should like. Make sure it's there, make sure that it's safe, make sure it hasn't got wires dangling all over the show, because then you know that it certainly can't be certified as being compliant. Um, and then very important, well, he has the questions for the uh, home electrical safety, which you put to the, uh, put to the employee as, as, as maybe a, a regular checklist. And then you also, importantly, because you're gonna be using electrical equipment, printers, computers, um, you know, your earth leakage is an important part. So there's a picture of an earth leakage unit and also regularly check your earth leakage unit switch. If you, if you trip it, um, then it should, it should go off and it should be no electricity to the plugs. 
Then a last one is your well-being. Very, very important. Maybe the most important one is uh, just some some help on well-being. You know, um, I've stolen this one from Aspen Pharmacare with permission. Um, choose a dedicated workspace and set yourself up for success. Communicate expectations with all those at home um, and tell them about distractions and planned breaks. Create a routine and take breaks as planned. Identify your own high productivity periods and use those at best. Communicate proactively with your team and keep abreast of priorities. And keep abreast of your own priorities and the company's priorities and the business priorities. So stay part of the team. Um, use technology to stay connected and remain easy to reach yourself. Um, make time to check in socially with colleagues. Stay hydrated, eat healthy food. Plan and stick to a daily finishing time. And I added on today also for late emails, just, just make, make your email protocol once or twice a day. And that's it, end of story. And then make time to exercise and stretch regularly. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Jan Lapier dealing with the employer employee duties with regard to occupation of the safety in the work from home setting and scenario. And as you've noticed, very practical um, tools and guidelines that uh, Dr. Lapierre has also shared. So we've had the sequence of the introduction to working from home. Uh, that is the regula regulatory framework and particular case law that's been dealt with by Mr. George Khan with the support of his colleague, uh, Dr. Um, Mudimo um, from Richespur um, Inc. Inc. Attorneys, Incorporated Attorneys. And then we swapped around and asked uh, Mr. Tibor Zana and Ms. Meliratis just to deal with the input from the, compensate, uh, the Department of Employment's Labor's of OH&S uh, uh, division, as well as the compensation fund. And now finally, on the question of the employee employee duties, Dr. Jan Lapier. I'm going to just quickly allow five or so minutes for overall comments um, from our speakers. And that includes um, uh, George Khan, Ms. Meliratis, as well as Dr. Jan Lapier. Um, on those dominant questions that you found in the question and on, uh, answer box and any final comments. Maybe I could start with you, George. Sure, um, thank you, thank you. Um, that was very, very interesting. In terms of the questions that uh, seem to be coming up, um, there's a lot of stuff about when would something be considered to be occupational at home. And I mean, that's split into two scenarios. One is dealing specifically with a COVID-19. When would that be occupational? And then the other issue is when it would be something non-COVID related. So um, I think the doctor actually answered the question quite well when he talked about somebody tripping on the carpet. The answer to the question isn't a blanket principle answer. Our courts have basically said that something is occupational when it arises in the ordinary scope and course of a person's employment. Now, that is going to have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, our courts, someone asked a specific question about what happens if they get raped at home, that sort of thing, is that occupational? Our courts have looked at that actual issue. So what happened was there was a doctor who was raped while she was working at a medical hospital. Um, she actually coincidentally sued the government because she was working in a public hospital. And they tried to say, well, COIDA is applicable. It's an occupational issue and therefore the grants them the immunity. The court said that that is not the case. And the reason for that is because the rape is not something that would ordinarily one would expect to happen in their normal work environment. Same, I would say, with a certain robberies. I mean, I understand that there are certain professions that contemplate some sort of um, crime aspects. If you're a security guard, maybe you can say, if you get into a scuffle with a robber, that's part of your job. But for the majority of people, if you are involved in some sort of criminal thing and you are injured as a, a consequence of it, that may not be occupational. However, it also depends on the particular case. So what might be is, is that maybe you are trying to run in order to secure your colleagues at work. Um, so you're trying to 
close the gate or something like that and you trip and you fall or something like that, or you're doing something which you've been instructed to do for security purposes by the employer, that would fall within the scope of your employment. Okay, thanks, George. I think we may have either lost your microphone there or you stopped. Um, thanks for that. I'm going to quickly hand over to um, Ms. Reiters. Um, Ms. Reiters, if there's any um, final comments, overarching observations you have with regard to the questions that have been asked by the um, attendees, um, can you just unmute your microphone? Okay, so I think uh, what people are asking is if there's going to be guidelines that will be issued by the Department of Employment and Labor and the Compensation Fund. The answer to that is yes. There is some work that we are doing with um, the OHS Inspectorate as well as us as the Compensation Fund, uh, where we will then be gazetting um, some of those uh, guidelines and maybe even looking potentially later at uh, regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was hoping to draw in the chief inspector also into that particular question. Thank you for your response. Unfortunately, because of um, other obligations, he's had to leave us as soon as he had done his presentation. Thanks for that, Ms. Reiters. Over to Dr. Jan Lapierre. You've heard the other presentations, you've seen the question, question, answer box. What's the final critical comments you would like to leave our attendees with before we conclude? Dr. Lapierre? Thank you again, Ashraf. Uh, um, maybe for George um, and um, his uh, doctoral candidate, um, if, if one looks at the Mine Health and Safety Act, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything about working from home. You're not an employee if you work from home, and the workplace is not from home. So my question is, um, and it probably doesn't have to be answered here, but it's it's a academic legal question is, would it then not be that the employee who, who works for a mining employer falls under the Occupational Health and Safety Act when he or she works from home? But from for all our attendees, I, I would like just like to, to put five points down if you've got a pen with, when you're doing working from home. Um, what's happening now mostly is people are sent home and they more or less scratch themselves through the whole through the whole predicament and then those five points are covered posthumously as as a crisis comes a point is covered so if if, if you look at point one it's initiation um, when when the employer decides that people can work from home should work from home when an employee decides that he wants to work from home that project needs to be initiated. And I've given those three, three slides out there or four slides out there on general employer and employee aspects to consider. The second one is it needs to be planned. Those, the, each of those aspects needs to be discussed. And you know, as, as, as hard as discussion must be, um, if, it require, if we, I require a chair to work from home, I want my chair from home. Um, so that's, that, that's gotta be planned. The, the third aspect is agreement. Um, whether you should put it in writing or not, some, some uh, writers say that you should have it in writing, you should amend your contract in writing for this, um, but this may not be required, certainly isn't legally required, but there should be an agreement, whether on paper or in word. Then the fourth aspect, there must be a risk assessment. Uh, you, you, you probably won't be able to go to the employee's house and do the risk assessment, so you can issue those documents those, those, those examples that I've given and make them more comprehensive if you want to, to make sure that uh, the employee does a self-inspection, a risk assessment, and those risks are then brought back to the number two planning and to number three, the agreement, so that finally that employee can work safely at home. And then as, on an ongoing basis, you, it, it's, it's good to require those self-inspections like the electrical one, like the ergonomic one. So that's the five, initiation, planning, agreement, risk assessment, and self-inspection. Ashraf? That's absolutely brilliant uh, for a conclusion. Um, I am now going to just thank all of our 
as guest speakers, they have again taken the time to prepare as well as to take the time to present and deal with all of our questions today. And for the patience of our attendees, we have run over time, but I think it is time well spent. Um, sometimes one plans a webinar, Dr. Lapierre, and then we want to do an assessment when things don't go so well. Um, but I think today has been an, an amazing um, session again. It's on one of those uh, maybe soft and fuzzy topics that uh, we don't always openly speak about. And we've had the great advantage of, and I keep on saying Dr. Mudimo, my apologies, a PhD student, um, Mudimo. <clears throat> um, I'm catching up with myself and um, the senior associate, Mr. George Khan from Richespoor Incorporated Attorneys. Gentlemen, thank you very much always for being available when called upon to assist us in our webinars. And then to uh, the chief inspector, Mr. Tibozana, uh, that's uh, in the um, OHS section of the Department of Employment Labor and his colleague, Ms. Mali Reiters, who's the chief director for medical services at the Compensation Fund, an important division also of the Department of Employment Labor. Thank you very much, uh, sir and lady, for your contributions. And then finally, again, Dr. Jan Napier has just taken us home and we'll be concluding in a moment. Um, I noticed that there are some questions there in the, in the question and answer box. I'm going to ask our uh, presenters to hold on for a few minutes, have a quick look again at those. I think it's um, hopefully nobody's going to say thank you and very insightful um, in the question and answer box. We need to keep that box clear and we need to now clear um, conclude all the um, uh, questions there. So please don't add any more thank yous in the question answer box. Type it in the chat box, please, not in the Q&A box. So, and thank you very much, everybody. And this is where I'm concluding. We see you in the next webinar. For your information, our next webinar next week is going to deal with the question of uh, long COVID on Thursday, the 8th of July. Um, that is long COVID in the workplace, an update by some of our specialists there. Um, there is a separate construction webinar on Friday the 9th. And then we continue with um, on uh, Thursday the 15th of July with COVID-19 and skin conditions in the workplace. And hopefully if all falls together, we will deal with the other soft sort of fuzzy topic of droplets. Is it the dominant form and the route of transmission versus aerosols? Or is this now also a key and important route of transmission which you consider? And looking at aerosols, we need to obviously consider ventilation. That hopefully will be consolidated for the 22nd of July. And on that note, thank you very much for joining the NIH again here on another one of our COVID-19 webinar series. Goodbye.